G'day, welcome to another gun video on my channel. Now today we're going to do something not so much different, but we're going to actually combine a gun review history video with a gun repair maintenance video. Uh, the reason for that is, we'll get to this rifle in a minute, uh, but I've got this really weird rifle and I've got very little history on it. Uh, I, there's very little history on the, the company and everything, so that's not going to take very long. But I've just got this, uh, haven't done anything to it, so um, it's going to need a little bit of bit of TLC, let us say. So we're going to tack that on the end. And yeah, let's have a look at this rifle. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, first thing you're probably going to think to yourself is, man, that's a weird looking rifle. And it is, which is why I bought it, I must admit. Now what this is, this is a Noble Model 275 lever action 22 rifle. Now, Noble, it's American made, um, and even most American gun enthusiasts probably haven't even heard of Noble. So uh, I've done all sorts of attempts to um, to look on the net and get some information and history so I can present a bit of a historical thing about the Noble Firearms Manufacturing Company and there's very little available. But what there is, I'm going to tell you about. So excuse me, I've just got these notes because uh, I've been looking on the net. Now the Noble Manufacturer, Firearms Manufacturing Company uh, operated, I, I've seen various dates, uh, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that it, they went under in 1971, uh, but the most common range that's given for manufacturing dates is from 1953 to 1971. Now they were located in Haydenville, Massachusetts. Haydenville was established in the mid 1800s and was located on the Mill River near Williamsburg in Massachusetts. The main industry there was what they called a brass mill, uh, a large industrial complex that produced brass fittings. Articles produced included brass water faucets, brass fittings for the end of firemen's hoses and beer spigots for bars. Today Haydenville is a, is a, a historical village with the old brass mill with its Gothic revival architecture as the main attraction. Now one wonders whether back in the 1950s and 60s when this was just a derelict industrial complex whether it was actually leased by the Noble Farms Manufacturing Company. Uh, that's only conjecture on my part but it is possible. Now I actually have sent a couple of emails to some contacts I found as far as historical societies and that area goes just to see if I get any more information but I haven't heard anything back so basically I can't tell you anything about who started the company. Noble made a range of semi-auto and pump action shotguns in 4, 10, 20, 16 and 12 gauge of their own design. They also imported some Spanish made double barrel shotguns and sold them under the Noble brand. Now in addition to this they also made a range of 22 rifles. There was some very simple uh, single shot uh, 22s followed by a range of pump action rifles. Then the lever action model 275 that we're looking at today. And then finally towards the very end of their production they also made the model 285 semi-auto 22 rifle which appears to be very rare there's very little information on that one uh, now when they went under in 1971 um, i did see in a forum somewhere someone said that winchester actually bought bought the company and you know kind of closed it down that was that may or may not be true um, but i did find in several places i think this is this is true uh is when they closed down, Smith and Wesson actually bought the 
manufacturing rights to the Noble Model 66 pump action shotgun. Um, they re-engineered it a little bit and then they introduced it as the Smith & Wesson Model 916. So um, that seems to be, the, I found that in, in some quite um, believable, I uh, found it in multiple places and it's quite believable um, information. I'm not really going to talk about Noble shotguns at all. Um, but early on, they uh, they had a, they had some uh, little single shot um, 22 rifles, typical little um, bolt action rifles. We you know we the bolt and cock them like most other companies had uh, in those days. Sort of boys' rifles, I suppose you call them. There was a Model 10 and there was a Model 20, and there was a Model 222. Now a very common one, it seems, looking on YouTube was the model. They had a Model 33 pump action, which was made from 1949 to 1953. Um, and that's funny about the dates, because um, so I found different dates, which said they started in 49. Some said they started in 53. But then this was a list of guns that they made. So, but anyway, very early on, they made the Model 33 pump action. They did some modification, some sort of modification to it. it became the 33A which was made from 53 to 55. Now there's a few of those on YouTube, so they must have made a few of those. And then that one was modified a little bit um, and became the Model 235 pump action. Um, and they, uh, yeah, there's a few of those on, on the net, you see. The Noble Model 33 was made from 1949 to 1953. It was available either with a standard timber stock and fore-end or a T-Knight plastic stock and fore-end. Now it's, it's normally said that the Remington Nylon 66 was the first plastic stock production rifle. Uh, but it seems like Noble beat them to it by at least a decade. Sometime in the mid to late 1950s, the Model 33A was modified to produce the Model 235. This was produced right through until the end of production in 1971. So let's just introduce this one. This is the Noble Model 275 lever action rifle. Now I did read in a couple of places that this rifle is actually just a modified version of the Model 235 pump action where they've taken the pump um, the pump fore end off and then actually connected a lever to the operating um, mechanism to make it, pump, make it a lever action. And when you look at the design of this, I actually do believe that that is probably true. Here's a top view of the receiver of a uh, Model 235 that I got off the internet and there is absolutely no difference between this and my rifle. I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference without seeing the lever. Because uh, this is just a bit sort of tacked on the outside kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and if you look at pictures on the net of the 235, apparently the magazines are identical, the barrels are identical, so it's this plug at the back, the actual receiver is identical. So there may be some slight changes to the internal parts in here, but uh, and obviously the stock's different because the pump's only going to have the stock down to here and the pump part up here. But, um, but yeah, I think that's probably true. So I think, I haven't got any definitive proof, but I think this is actually a modified version of the 235 made into a lever, which is pretty kind of interesting, really. Um, I'll show you this more closely um, in a little while when we, when we sort of look closely at it. Um, now, the other thing I should mention is that Model 235 pump action was also sold by Harrington and Richardson. So it would have been Mark Harrington and Richardson, no noble marking, so if you had one you could think it was American and Richardson. And here's a photo of one, as you can see, it looks like a 235, but it's actually marked as a Harrington and Richardson model 422. So just in case you happen to have one, that was actually just a noble model 235 pump. 
Um, now another one I saw mention, I've seen no photos, it must have been fairly unusual, was a 285 semi-auto. So that basically goes through the what I can find as far as the 22. So um, now this is a Noble Model 275. They were also sold under at least two other names. Um, a common brand of these seemed to be American Eagle, so they were called American Eagle, written on here, no Noble, just said American Eagle Model 275, everything else the same. And I also found reference to them being uh, marketed as Western Field as well. So what we'll do now is we'll come in and get a bit of a closer look at this rifle. Right, let's have a look at this rifle. So as you can see, it's got quite a nicely figured walnut stock. Um, let's start at the start of the, the boring end. Um, so we've got a Bakelite butt plate. It's got a couple of, got a bit of a chip out of it, but um, not too bad. Now, coming up to the action now, um, a lot of people comment on this lever. It's really nicely colour case hardened, which is sort of um, goes against the uh, sort of uh, general fairly cheap build of the rest of it. So as you can see it has this kind of pressed metal plate screwed to the stock which I haven't had it apart but presumably that is holding this part here which the lever is then screwed to. This Phillips head screw looks a bit out of place but uh, I've seen on the net that it is actually a standard feature. The rear screw is however a plain one. Now looking at this, it seems there seems to be a trigger. See that there? There's seems to be a trigger safety, whether it works or not, I don't know. Um, sort of like a Winchester and Marlins both have those. Levers actually held on just by this kind of fairly cheap looking bolt and nut. Someone's obviously had a go at having it apart because it's all chewed up. Um, so we've got on the top here, we can see it's top eject. We've got a safety catch there. There's a cap there, which obviously during the disassembly, which we're going to have a go at in a minute. Um, now the receiver is uh, uh, machined with uh, standard American size dovetails. The barrel is uh, I think about 24 inches it's actually a reasonably heavy barrel too for a rifle like this and focus Noble model 275 Noble Manufacturing Company Incorporated Haydenville Massachusetts 22 caliber short long long rifle you see they've got their own little proof mark uh, if you're familiar with Winchester firearms they have a little WP in a circle and Noble have obviously got their own little proof mark NP so it's a little proof mark on there um, and then we've actually got a serial number at the back which uh, would be would have been done here because this rifle wouldn't have had a serial number um, that was another thing that the NFA National Firearms Agreement did was it mandated that all firearms had to have a serial number on them uh, before that for 1968 a lot of American 22 rifles especially they weren't really considered a firearm in a lot of ways they were you know they were didn't weren't considered serious enough to put a serial number on reasonably cheap pressed steel sight and elevator um pretty typical magazine tube we'll look more we'll closely at that in a minute and this kind of weird looking I'm not quite sure what's going on with this front sight here got a screw on it. it's obviously something to do with elevation I haven't mucked around with that it looks like there's a dovetail in there and then maybe the side is screwed onto a thing in the dovetail but anyway um, now one weird thing about this rifle I'm not sure whether this is a later modification or not um, the muzzles counterboard and it seems to have a kind of a thread 
in there. So whether someone has threaded it for a silencer at some stage in the past, I'm not quite sure, or whether that they came from the factory like that, but I'm not quite sure about that. But anyway, now, this is in, this. Let's get into the interesting stuff now. I'm sort of holding my iPhone to do this. I'm using my iPhone because it just focuses better close range than my digital camera. So if we, so as you can see, the actual bolt locks up into the into the receiver. So this is obviously the locking surface at the back here. Um, so as you pull the lever, it goes down, goes back. Now. If we have a look at this, if I pull this back, you can see, see that funny looking little thing going up there. So I saw that at the gun shop when I went to pick up this rifle and thought, well, that's a bit weird, but you know, that's the design. One thing after mucking around with this I noticed is that thing there that you can see there, that's actually the follower for the magazine so um so what i'll do now is i'll pull the magazine out oh so actually before i do that i'll just make a note of something so if i pull this up if you watch the magazine see that the whole magazine moves now um most most tube fed firearms paint action levers whatever the magazine stays in place uh, and just feeds the firearm, uh, feeds the cartridges. One other um, notable exception to that is the Remington Model 12, which was designed by John Peterson. Now I've got one of those and I've actually got a video up on that. So if you want to have a look at that, but the whole magazine moves in that as well. Um, anyway, let's take the magazine cap. Now, one thing I noted with this rifle was everything on it is caked in some sort of black oil internally so actually this is quite difficult to pull out just because of the surface tension of that black i think so there's a typical thing that i see with some of these firearms that i buy from um dealers in the country they i think they come off farms where the owners when they started getting a bit dry and dusty they they get the sump plug from or the you know thing from their their vehicle and just put a bit of black sump oil in it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pull this apart shortly and clean it out. But anyway, there's the magazine tube. So typical magazine tube made of brass. But most magazine tubes, the follower will be captive at the end. They'll be slightly crimped at the end so that the follower is captive. So when you shove it in. The cartridges go inside the tube and push push it up whereas this has got this it's sort of kept that part of the spring is captive and then it's got this bit this follower that's just boinging on the end um and it's obviously initially i thought that this was a uh, a fault with the rifle but then when i what i did was i actually loaded some um dummy rounds in um and just using put it up so gravity fed the rounds down the magazine it still fed all of the rounds until the very last case and then it didn't eject that and then i when i look at this i realize you can see it's got a lifter like most most lever or most tube fed mag rifles but it doesn't actually have an ejector and then i've realized that the actual that uh, follower for the magazine actually acts as the ejector so when when the magazine's full and that's way down the magazine well the next cartridge along actually pushes the previous case from underneath when the lifter lifts up um, it pushes the previous case and um, out the top but then when you get to the last case there wouldn't be one to push out so what happens is this follower goes on top of the lifter and then the lifter pushes it up and then that pops the pops the case out so um so let's actually i might load her up with some dummy rounds and uh, we'll have a look at that all right so we've got cartridges in the magazine 
Let's see how we go. So I'll tuck this under my arm. Now, okay, see, so that went into the follow, and then the follow has actually jammed that cartridge up behind the extractor and the cartridge guide, so it's lined up with the chamber. So it actually seems to feed, I haven't fired this or anything, but it seems to feed pretty well. Now, if we open the lever, see, so that previous one, just push that one out. Watch this one. There you go. See that? So that follower popped that up and chucked it out. So as you can see, it seems to feed pretty well. Uh, and it feeds without the front of the cartridge actually being controlled. So what I'm planning to do now is to disassemble this rifle. Now, as far as assembly goes, there's no instructions whatsoever available. On Gun Parts Corporation, they've actually got the Model 275 listed and they've actually got a schematic listed if you're familiar with the Gun Parts Corporation website but when you go to the schematic that they list they've got the wrong one on there they've actually got the 235 pump action rifle on there so um so there's no available online source for a parts diagram or instructions on disassembly with this so we're just going to have to wing it All right, so let's get in to see if we can get this thing apart. Now, what I might first do first is just take this, um, well, I'll undo the screw for the lever, and we'll see if the lever comes off. Or it may, it may well not, because it may be connected inside. So, um, butchered the screw. Don't know why, because it's not tight. There you go, the lever came out. So obviously that we need to when we put it back in we need to make sure that goes into wherever it goes into so um right so the next thing we might do is so when i look at the magazine tube up there it slides back and forth and now the cap's off so i might just get a small bit here. Need to really get it out of the stock for a start, don't we? So we're going to kind of see what's what's what and where's where. I've got a Phillips head here ready to do this one here. They're all a bit mangled with the screws. Someone's been mucking around with it. So that there's, oh, uh, that came off, so that's only just a very thin piece of sheet metal. So this is, so this metal here is connected to the inside. Now, when I look at the front of the, uh, see some of these rifles, some rifles when you remove the magazine, the tubular magazine, you have to pull the magazine out from the front because they're in a, like a Winchester 92, for example, because uh, they're in their own hole in the fore end. But this one, um, you can see it's it's just in a slot, so I should be able to just pull the stock off. So, Either repair or make new ones on one lane, make it a little bit better. Nothing worse than a rifle with a firearm with mangled 
screws are alive. Oh. oh yeah, okay, so that's good. Yeah, so that's like that's actually a wood screw. Goes through here and into the stock. getting somewhere. So look at the, a lot of these old rifles, this is kind of just full of dirt and dust. So we'll give that all a good scrub before we put it back together again. So let's have a bit of a look at this beastie. Let's put the lever back in. Ah, oh, I see. So there's, so there's a little there's a little knob in there which the lever sits on there. There we go. Let's put the let's put the uh lever screw this the lever screw on there. Let's just put that back in there for a minute. So we can see how this works. There we go. So you can kind of see if you can actually look at this. So say we were to take the lever away, take this thing away, and stick a four in on this on this thing, it would then become a pump action, wouldn't it? Anything it doesn't do is is unlock. As I pull the lever down, it's actually unlocking it. I can't unlock it by pushing that, but quite possibly, this is obviously pulling down here, quite possibly they had some sort of cam arrangement with the pump action, so you pull it back and it actually unlocked like that before it opened. So that's very interesting. So there's a screw there. It's also a bit loose. Okay, so that screw's loose. I just noticed it wasn't. Not sure if it's meant to be threaded into this hole or not. There's a pin. Oh, there's a screw at the front and the back here. Yeah, it is. So it looks like that one there is kind of stripped or not long enough or something. Yeah. So it's all, as you can see, it's all very pressed pressed steel etc. Yeah. with this thing at the back here. Alright. Put again. So we can see here that's actually connected to the lifter so as it the lifter goes down when it goes forward it comes back when it hits that there that pushes the lifter up I think guess the next thing I'll do is take both of these screws out here doing this carefully so anyone who wants to pull one of these apart in the future has got a bit of an idea where to start. So this screw that goes through here actually engages that slot in the back. So that's how you take that off. Take the front and spring out. Now in there is that there, that's actually the hammer, it's a linear hammer. So there's the sear surface there, the sear hooks on that. Uh, Main spring is goes into that hole, goes into that guide, so it's compressed like that. And when the sear lets go, this goes forward and hits the back 
of the firing pin, which I'll show you in a minute. What have we got going on here, I wonder? Alright, so we've still got the bolt connected to the operating rod for magazine tube slash operating rod for. Alright, so let's pull this apart. Alright, so that one. Oop! Whoa, look at that. Alright, so let's. There we go, so we got the barreled action. Because one of my next jobs is to obviously to put a brush through the board. One thing I know with the lever, after I went to clean the lever, after I've taken it out before, it actually has this little collar that goes in there, so don't lose that when you're pulling the lever out. I've discovered that the main design defect in this rifle is these two cross pins or screws. You can see, and you can see people have been working on them. The reason for that is they're only actually threaded into this tiny little bit of one and a half mil of sheet steel here, and both of them are stripped. I think the screw the thread and the screws themselves are stripped, and because they hold the whole kind of thing together, as the as the whole lever system is going back and forth, they take a fair bit of force. And when I put this back together before. I was trying to test the the, uh, the lever system and it was just jamming up and then it didn't matter how many times I put these things and they just kept coming loose and falling out again. It was driving me mad. I have discovered though, you just get them in as like about like they are now and then once you put it into the stock, it's fairly tight in the stock and the stock kind of holds them in place. So, and then we've got this here. So this will slide. Okay, just wiggle it back and up and down and the whole, that will come out and then there's one piece of uh, that's the little kind of thing. So, um, so we've got basically just this pressed metal thing. Um, there's the trigger, trigger and sear. Trigger return spring, I don't know if you can see, is a little bit mangled. Uh, that just pushes up on the bottom of the receiver. So that's one part that could be replaced as well. Um, it's just sitting, it seems to be pressed, pressed into a little hole in the, in the back of the trigger here assembly. So I'll look at that in the future. Um, I'll have to see whether I can find a piece of spring. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention was the, uh, the safety here. So um, you can see as the trigger's pulled that, that uh, block comes up. Safety is very simple if we pull that across that just stops the block being going, being able to go up all the way. So we pull that back. Now it can go right up. So it's very simple. Now the only other issue with this rifle is that trigger return spring. You can see it just goes into a hole in the actual um, trigger sear assembly. Um, and you can see probably from it being um, assembled and instead of pushing up on the trigger being bent over, um, you can see it's all a bit mangled and it's probably not, this trigger pull is very light, it's probably not very effectively because it should stick straight up there. So uh, before I, I don't want to muck it, pull it out before I actually get something to replace it with, but what I'll do now, I won't film it because it's a bit fiddly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll just measure the uh, major diameter of the spring and the wire diameter. I was had, having a look at this lever out of battery safety thing and I just couldn't work out how it would actually work when it was flopping around and then I noticed I hadn't looked that closely. See there's this little wire spring sitting inside the action there and that wire was just off to the side it wasn't actually doing anything and then I realised when I looked closely there's a little notch that thing so I just hooked it with a screwdriver and moved it across and now so that it's only when the lever is closed and it pushes that up it allows the trigger to go so now with all my degreasing and cleaning of firearms I just use this sort of stuff I just buy this from my local 
Auto Shop, it's about $2.50 a tin. Uh, and it's great for um, this sort of thing. So you can basically just do the outside first. Get rid of all that grease. Now I'm going to have to, when I pull it apart, I'm going to have to run a patch with this stuff through the um, through the internal of the in, through the bore of the, the magazine external magazine tube. And then that stuff will just wash straight off and take the grease with it. So that's now dry. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push that in a little bit. Spray a heap of it in there. Because as long as there's no dirt, you know, obviously lubrication is uh, important with a lot of firearms, but as long as there's no dirt uh, in the mechanism, a lot of these parts, I mean a part like this I don't think even really need any oil in it, you know, the, the, the spring's still going to push the cartridges. As I said, this is probably the most fragile and important part of the whole rifle, so um, I want to make sure that uh, it's all working well. So what I'll do. Yeah, there's actually a bit in there. Interestingly enough, there's a rough. See that? Which is probably why someone's oiled it. There's probably some corrosion in there. Oh yeah, look at all that coming out. So what I'm going to do? Is I'm going to shut that down. Get it to jam in there. I'm going to pass, spray a whole heap of this in here. Alright, so it's actually... As you can see, I took a lot of time just trying to uh, degrease and uh, get all the dirt and corrosion out of the inside of the magazine tube. As I was going, I could feel it getting smoother and smoother. And every time I tipped it up, there was grit and oily stuff coming out. Um, and I got to the end. By the time I'd finished doing this, the follow was just really smoothly going up and down the tube without any any drag. Um, and uh, once I'd finished, what I then did was, it's the middle of summer here, it's very hot. Um, I just actually put it on the windowsill so it was in the direct sunlight over the weekend. So, um, you know, very high heat there and um, that, uh, that would have dried all the water out of, from the inside of the tube. Now let's have a look at this. This is an interesting magazine come bolt <laughs> assembly. There's the lifter there, so the lifter just goes up and down like that. Apart now, interesting enough, if you look on the Gun Parts Corporation website, under the schematic for the Noble 275, it actually ha has a schematic for the 235, the pump action, quite clearly. However, if you start scrolling through the pages of parts, I suspect that they bought all the parts from Noble when they went when they closed up. They got large numbers of all sorts of parts. They got all these these things here. Um, a lot of these things are staked in place. These little springs, you can buy these springs here, that spring there, the little spring extractors, but yeah, they'd be a bit tricky to replace, I think. But um, anyway, so yeah, if you look closely at this, again, I'm not sure how you can see, but you've got two just pressed spring steel kind of extractor type of things which um, the cartridges actually come up underneath that before they start so it never has to click click over the car although it does click over if you put one in the magazine in the chamber and then close the lever uh, and then there's this other tiny little flimsy little spring which seems to be just a cartridge retainer so it seems like the cartridge comes let's check the cartridge and see what happens in the way. 
chuck the cartridge down the fill out the hole. Try again. Alright, so we've got a cartridge in there now. So this lifts it up. See that? Pushes it up underneath that thing there. Look at that. So that clicked in place um, and it was stopped by that little spring there. And that's, see, that's quite, that's actually amazing. Look at that. That's completely solidly held in there. So you can see whether that was a short, long, or long rifle. It's in line with the chamber, straight in. And then when the next cartridge comes along, put him in. I don't know if I'll have enough strength to do this, but without the leverage. Oh, there we go. So that's basically how it works. And But see, now that won't push that one because we need the follower for the magazine. So let's put that in. In its little, it's all been cleaned and it's really Mag follow up, magazine follow up, and that does that. So, um, really weird design, but kind of cool in a way. All right, now it's time to get this rifle back together. I've manufactured the new screws. Um, so again, if you're interested in that, uh, I've actually I'm putting up a video on making new screws. So anyway, there they are. There, they screw in nicely. So um, it'll be much easier now that it's not kind of tending to uh, just fall to bits all the time because the screws weren't working. All right, so now let's put it back together again. Um, I had a bit of issues doing this before. I think I've worked out the the, um, the tricks. So basically, what we need to do is get the receiver. We need to put that little slidey thing in its little slot there. Put this. Make sure that thing is flopping out the bottom. Put this. In there. As you can see, it's a bit kind of painful. This back. Right. So you can see that's now riding on these rails down here. So, um, so that's that. So, what we can then do is present that to the receiver and get. Oh, actually, one thing you've got to remember to do is thread this through the magazine ring and the barrel. Get that up. Okay. Now you've got to get the holes lined up with their holes. Don't worry too much about where the bolt is for a start. Alright, well that's pretty much got the screws lined up front and back. There, so at least you know it's because this is a problem I had a lot the other day, because the screws weren't biting. I was getting to this point and then trying to tighten it up and the screws were just going to come loose. And... Alright, so now we'll put the hammer in and get the spring and the back screw. Now, well, these are actually slightly... I've actually sized these. That's the back one there. Put that in there. Threaded hole lined up. At least I know it's going to thread in this time. Just 
just gotta be careful not to do this too tight. Alright, so that's in place there. Put this one in. Oops. problem I've had is when I fitted these screws I fitted them to the to the action housing and made it so it was just sticking out but I suspect now that we've shoved this down in it it's actually springing the action housing out a little bit and that screw and I, obviously I needed to make sure that screw wasn't too long so it was stuck out there and interfered with putting it in and it stop but by the same means I think it's now a touch short all right so that's now ready to go into the stock, I think. Now, before I put it together, I'm going to put the lever in and I'm going to recycle the action, see if that hammer, just the, having that hammer in the way seems to create problems. So, Seems like it has to be upright to um, to open the action. All right, so so I'm going to hold it there so that that this is what I did last time. So that, that is straight up and down. And I'm going to very carefully put this in here. Very carefully put that in there. Right. Trying not to touch the trigger because we don't want it to fire. Now I did try it. it, it's marked short, long, long rifle. I did try it with both shorts and longs. The rifle is supposed to hold up to 18 shorts, but when you load them in and then try to push the magazine tube back in, they just don't tend to slide into the tube easily. And I guess at this stage we just can't get them in. So you really only can get in about 10 at a time. I think just because of the short uh, size of the shorts, they just sort of probably don't slide straight. They probably all cock off to the side, so they won't slide evenly in. Uh, I had to actually take a few out because I just couldn't load it. But it just doesn't seem to be a problem with uh, when you're loading it with long rifles. They obviously slide in more easily. Right, so this is sort of a reason why I would probably not use shorts in this rifle actually this has come out in the sun so you can see what's happened 
you see that we've got two cartridges that have gone down and as I was pushing them down the actual action came open because I was pushing on the magazine and then as soon as the action came open the two that were down the bottom popped their heads up and now I've emptied the rest out of the magazine but I've got to try to get these two out so it's a bit of a pain really so it's, that's not going to happen with the long ones just the shorts they're so small and short that you know they just flip up okay here we go all right that one was fine all right so there you go All right, now I've got some Z Longs. Uh, these are Aussie made. Unfortunately, um, Winchester production in Australia is about to end, so these have been available forever here, but I doubt very much whether they'll be available any longer after that. But anyway, if you're not familiar with a long, it's basically a long rifle case with a little um, 29 grain, little short bullet, the same as the 22, at lower velocities. These are 770 feet per second. They're very quiet, which is why I've got them. You know, they're good for sort of built up area use so let's just uh, see how the, hopefully they'll load a bit easier than the shorts did all right let's see how that goes Same sort of problem, you've got to kind of rotate the, the tube around. Anyway, that's got it. So let's have a look here. Okay, here we go. But uh, yeah, they don't feed quite as nicely as the twin long rifles. Yep. Right, uh, so. It holds 15 rounds, but I'm going to um, I'm only going to put 11 in because the uh, the speedy loader holds 11. See if I can get this to work, that's better. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going on here? Oh, that's it. <laughs> All 11 in this time. Oops. Make it 10 because one just fell out. 10 will do. Yeah, that's better. They all went in that one. That's right. Yeah. All right. So maybe, maybe uh, film, let's film the um, film lesson. Let's kind of show this. Let's zoom in on here. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. So you can see uh, where I've got this patch group. I actually shot this group and the camera ran out of memory before I'd actually uh, managed to film it. So uh, I had to patch and reset. Uh, but you can see it's not a bad group. Um, the day before I actually shot about a two inch group, I was shooting a lot more slowly and carefully and there was no wind uh, than on this day. So um, that was not too bad. 
but anyway so I had to delete some uh, memory off my camera but I still didn't have a lot of memory left so I had to quickly reset open the range and shoot this 10 shot group reasonably quickly so there's the first shot there that's actually the worst one um, of course the sights on this rifle are pretty average so I think a, a decent set of sights with a nice little round bead on the front would allow this sort of uh, this sort of shooting to uh, group a lot better but as you can see they're sort of pretty well centered um, there we go that one's a V ball I think I think out of the uh, by the time I finish shooting the group out of the 10 shots I get three V balls this is at 50 meters if I didn't mention that so um, pretty much the maximum range for a rifle of this type with open sights so uh, but most of those shots would be uh, good enough to hit a uh, small critter uh, at that range See the target blowing around, but there we go. There's another V ball. And I think that might be it. One, two, three. I guess let's look. Let's look at um, positives and negatives. I guess. <coughs> um, now I don't know. It's a negative or positive. It's a weird, ugly-looking rifle, but in a way, it's kind of it's different. Um, I suppose the biggest negative is the fact that it, uh, you know, some of it looks like it's been made out of recycled baked bean tins. Um, but um, as far as positives go, uh, listen, well, I mean, I suppose with the rifle like this, the most, most important thing is, is it cycle and does it say what it says on the tin? I uh -huh, get it. Um, and yes, uh, I. Uh, I've fired about 200 rounds of long rifle ammo through this, uh, mainly federal uh, just standard velocity, and I didn't have a single failure to feed. It fed perfectly once it was cleaned, um, and you know the magazine tube was you know fixed up and everything. But once it was cleaned, it fed perfectly. So as far as feeding, you saw that video um, of me shooting this rapid fire. Um, yeah, it just fed really well. So. I was pleasantly surprised, I must say. What I'm going to do just before I finish is I'm just going to re have another quick recap on what you need to look for if you're buying one of these. I mean, it's all probably in the earlier video, but I'll just remind you what to do. So what I'll do is um, I'll get my iPhone, which is much better for close-ups, and we'll just have a quick look at this action, just to give people who might be thinking of buying my idea of what, you know, when you go to the gun shop and you're looking at it, what to look for, because, you know, I've been mucking around with this for the last month, and, um, you know, I've kind of pretty much learned all there is to learn, I think. This advice not only applies to the Model 275 lever action, but also to the pump action models, the 33s and 235, because the actual feeding and mag magazine mechanism is all exactly the same so they've got the same these same clips and magazine parts and follow and everything like any rifle uh whether 22 or center five if you're looking at buying one probably one of the first things to do of course is to check the bore um now you can't really check without completely disassembling the rifle you can't check from the from the rear in this but you can uh, either get one of those little curved um bore light things that you can kind of put in here and look down the bore or a good trick if you're just out looking at a rifle somewhere and uh you want to have a look at the bore is just get yourself a little piece of uh white nice bright white paper somewhere just fold it up and uh put it in the in there like that so what that does is reflects light uh into the chamber uh, put that under the light so we'll come over here so if you put that on the light like that uh, and then you can look down the bore and you've got a reasonably good view, view of the bore so that's a good trick to look at in any rifle that you're looking at the next uh, step you want to take after you've made sure that the bore is in good condition is check out the magazine so that's a pretty easy thing to do in the in the gun shop or the whoever's got the gun Pull it out, make sure it's uh, all solid, the brass is solid, no dens or dents or dings. 
And then pay attention to this end bit. Make sure that uh, the spring is intact. Like this always flops around a bit, that's normal, but make sure it doesn't look like there's any actual damage there. Now the other thing that might be worth doing is find something um, to just push that in, make sure that it freely moves into the magazine, the follower. So to do that you might want to find something that uh, is a bit smaller than a 22. So the screwdriver is pretty much ideal. Yeah, so just make sure that the follower goes in and comes out normally. So when you put the magazine back in this rifle, always got to make sure that, that follower doesn't get caught in the mag in the loading port. So make sure it goes past that and once it goes there, you can uh, put it in. So there's that. Now the other thing to do really is um, obviously cycle the action and make sure it actually cycles and it's not jammed or anything like that. Um, you know you can see you can see it locking up there. Now the last thing you need to check if you're looking at a rifle one of these rifles to buy is just the uh, extractor and I'm just going to try to get this so you can actually see it. Alright, so there you can sort of see it there. Let's just try to get this level. So, if you watch the whole video, you'll know that um, you've got so there are two extractors on one on either side. They're actually pinned to the side of the of the the breech block, and they're um, they're spring loaded, and so. You just got to make sure that those are intact and um, if you kind of push them maybe get maybe even get something and just make sure that they're spring loaded just trying to do this and look at the camera and you can see that spring loaded and then you'll see there's this other little one. See this one just here, which actually is just a little kind of bit of spring steel that comes out with an angle on it. And that's that's kind of a cartridge stop. So that as the cartridge comes up from underneath, that stops it. And then as it's pushed harder, that um, bends out of the way and lets the cartridge come up. So so you can see um, you can, you've got a good view of that cartridge guide, that, that extractor cartridge guide there now see how it's they're actually quite wide whereas this one here is just a little if we go to the other side I've actually got a light so you can see it there so bring a light with you so you can you can um, look down in there bring some sort of in instrument like you know a little screwdriver there's a bit bigger screwdriver I've got here but uh, oops it'll do for now um, so that you can you can try pushing Make sure everything's all the spring loaded bits are, are spring loaded. Um, and if all of those things are in good condition, then the rifle is probably going to be a goer because there's really nothing else inside here that's likely to be uh, damaged, you know, or non fixable. So, as long as the magazine works and as long as it cycles and as long as those little spring parts work uh, then it's probably worth uh, worth getting if you're interested in buying one so if you're looking at one of these rifles uh, with a thought to buying it the first thing I would do is decide what you're going to use it for if you're going to do a lot of shooting with it it's going to be have a lot of heavy use I would suggest you're probably better looking for one of the you know, more non-brands of lever action like Winchester, Browning, Morocco um, just because it's, I think it would be more it's going to last a lot longer with heavy use um, you know because once these little, any of these little springs or whatever go I think that's going to be you're probably not going to fix one of these however you see one of these and you know you do what I said and just make sure that it's in good functional condition and the price is right um, 
I say go for it. I'm actually really quite happy with this rifle. It feeds really nicely. It's, reasonable. it's plenty accurate for this type of rifle. Uh, it's well balanced. It's, uh, you can shoot it offhand quite well. You can shoot it, the sights aren't fantastic, admittedly. They could, they could probably do it be pretty, pretty easily replaced. That's the beauty of an American rifle, you know, you've got three eight-inch ducktails. So probably, um, I don't know, I have to have a look at that front sight, but I'm thinking of actually replacing this with a better quality sight and then maybe putting a marble, working out the height, putting just a marble bead on the front. Um, and that would probably improve the sights markedly. The balance points just there under the, under the sides there, pretty much. So, um, and with this video you've probably got all the information that you need to be able to make that decision. So, good luck with it. Anyone who watches this video and goes out and buys one, put it down in the comments, let us know about it, let us know how it's going. So that concludes this video, it was a bit of a marathon one. If you like this kind of content, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and please push the like button. And until next time, thanks for watching.